Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be presenting about um, cultural cravings um, within the Cuban psyche, um, specifically talking about rice and pork. Um, so I'm recording this a bit after the conference, and I think it will be added in. Um, but actually, there was no introduction during the conference. So I'll just say uh, my name is Mallory. I'm a PhD candidate um, at Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa um, in the Department of History. And I'm currently, uh, my research focuses on um, a comparative food systems analysis between Cuba and a state in India called Kerala, um, which is also a communist state. Um, so if anyone would like to discuss this, I would be happy to, but today I'm, um, but today I'm going to discuss something, uh, of course, related, but a bit um, different from past research that I did. Um, I wrote my master's thesis in and on Cuba, where I collected over 25 um, oral histories using food to understand um, larger contemporary um, and historical phenomena. Um, I was also lucky to be mentored by the keynote of this conference that I'm recording this for, Rinaldo. So um, that was uh, a very nice connection that this presentation makes to um, his speech. So Anyways, um, today my presentation will be focused on um, a piece that I'm working on now, um, an article. So any feedback um, on my thoughts would be greatly appreciated. Um, specifically, I am trying to analyze the two most repeated ingredients found during my interviews, which were rice and pork. Um, so there have been some very important historical analyses on um, famous Cuban, on, on um, rice by very famous Cuban historians um, and also pork, but with um, a different lens than what I am using. So the point of this research is to highlight a concept um, that I'm calling cultural hunger. So um, the expression, um, well, which I'm defining as the expression to me by many interviewees of a feeling of inadequacy um, of a meal without said foods, rice and pork. Um, and this is also touching on research that has been done in Cuba by anthropologist Hannah Garth. So um, she talks about the politics of adequacy um, in Cuba, which is a universal um feeling, of course, um, the cultural connection to food, but um, a lot of this inspiration also comes from her work. So um, rice and pork, both having different origins and cultural ties, um, are equally important, especially in the contemporary when discussing vulnerability of importation in Cuba. So that's what I'm going to be discussing today. Let's just get into it, really. Um, I would like to first touch on um, my methods. So let's consider the method and lens that I'm using um, falling into the realm of microhistory, so the collection of everyday experiences and memories um, of the everyday. And... Um, Therefore, I study less food as a material and tangible object and more people's experiences of systems through food. So this is especially useful and important when um, speaking about Cuba to Cubans specifically, because you are able to understand a lot about a system and how it is, also how it was, of course, without asking people to speak about things they don't want to speak about, um, which is the obvious. So um, therefore, for, for example, when I ask someone, what did you eat today? 
um, the conversation will usually go to where food came from. Um, and then you can understand why and how. So this tells you, let's just say, about the economic situation, um, currency, um, access to currency, exchange rates, um, production at that time, uh, access to materials. So um, this is kind of where, I mean, this is a very simplified version of what I'm doing and trying to do. So, um, I should also say that I place myself within memory studies. So, um, basically using food to trigger memory. And there is a lot of study on using food um, to bring out memories of the everyday, so of the mundane. And that's what I'm focused on, of course. So, I'd just like to read a small quote from a study um, in Java. Um, about memory work and food. So they state, feelings of being imposed on, of being bored, and of being judged and chided were not framed as a personal testimony of political injustice, but were embedded in the sensory recall of the unremarkable. So in the often minute emotional accommodations of the everyday. So that is the framework that I'm using. And now let's move on. So, um, it's also important to, um, oh, sorry, I would also like to mention that although um, the connection between agriculture and food is very obvious, I'm much less an agricultural historian, and therefore, I'm focusing on one side of the food chain, which tends to be about um, like procurement and consumption. Um, of course, that bleeds into um, production, but um, that's my main focus. So now I would like to move on to the discussion of food and nationalism um, and using food to trace histories of nationalism. So this is because before discussing these ingredients, it's also essential to explore how Cuban cuisine in general has formed and also how my interviewees express the significance of certain foods within that context of Cuban cuisine formation. So in general, defining a national cuisine has often been a crucial step, of course, in shaping a national identity. And many countries have used this strategy to create a sense of uniqueness, separation, um, to a point where it's very difficult to separate the ideas of food and nationalism. I mean, think about how people casually refer to Italian food um, as if the nation was not very recently formed and having very distinct regions within, um, and of course, traditions within one space that has been defined very um arbitrarily honestly um so um as stated by ronald ronta who studies of course food and nationalism maybe not of course who studies food and national very closely he says food related choices instill and reinforce an abstract reflexive yet particular idea of what the nation is and what its boundaries are so conversations of nationhood are closely tied to discourses around traditional food and the invention of tradition. So borrowing from Hobswam and Ranger, I argue that we must hold these two complex realities in mind. First, that these food-related events, traditions, and rituals might be invented or constructed, yet they often become a part of the cultural hegemony of a nation. And so in this way, they're both meaningful and enduring. So as we all know, Cuba has, a, as a society, has been um, formed with many influences, African, Spanish, um, American, obviously Caribbean in general. And the evolution of a Cuban cuisine has been deeply intertwined in the nation's nationalist struggle. So Marti, you know, Jose Marti, <laughs> 
And the separatists heavily promoted narratives of Cubanidad, a uniquely Cuban identity that unified different elements rather than focusing on distinctions. So Luis A. Perez describes the emergence of Cuban cuisine as a crucial part of the process. He states, at some point in the early 19th century, the proposition of a distinctive Cuban cuisine entered the Creole imagination, and the claim to a discernible national cuisine was itself a facet of a larger process by which the notion of nationhood assumed narrative coherence. The purpose, self-evident. Tastes for certain dishes and preference for certain preparations suggested culturally determined dispositions as a function of being Cuban. To corroborate the proposition of a national plate, palate, sorry, also plate, <laughs> a cuisine to enact a custom as a source of affinity. So the process was intentional. Cubans actively distanced themselves from their colonizers, the Spanish. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there are many colonizers, but let's say the Spanish. Um, through material choices about food. The Cuban took pleasure in his culinary taste by identifying himself with white rice, which is essential to this presentation, um, various types of beans, and strong coffee, clearly distinguishing himself from the Spaniard who remained attached to his chocolate drink and imported chickpe chickpeas, the cuisine of La Madre Patria. So, that is that. <laughs> Um, let's move on. Where does rice and, oh, I'm so sorry. I actually had a part about, um, the general connections between food and Cuban history, but I actually skipped this, um, during the presentation in the conference. So I am going to skip this now, although that is also an essential thing to consider, which is the various impacts of different agricultural and food transitions within the country. Um, let's move on to rice and pork. So, um, where do rice and pork fit into la cocina cubana? We all know when we talk about Cuban food, we're referring to a cuisine of many influences. Garth describes the archetypical Cuban meal includes white rice, beans, a meat dish, um, preferably pork, starchy tuber vivandas, salad, and often fruit juice. One of my interviewees elaborates on this fusion, pointing out the significant influences of Spanish, African, and Caribbean in the cuisine. Yet, despite these diverse influences, Cubans generally see their diet as distinctly Cuban, which is important, a reflection of national identity, as we discussed before. Now, Rice was introduced to Cuba during Spanish colonization and rapidly became a dietary staple. The reverence for, reverence for rice in Cuba in Cuban cuisine is profound. Perez emphasizes that rice forms an obligatory presence at the Cuban table, with Cubans possessing extensive knowledge about various preparations. The high per capita rice consumption in Cuba further underscores this significance, even though they've never achieved full self-sufficiency. Um, actually, I don't include this fact, but um, there is an exorbitant amount of rice that is consumed by Cubans, and I think almost 90% is imported. That I'll need to fact check myself, but something around there. The dependence um, on imported rice has been a persistent issue shaped by Cuba's sugar-centric agricultural economy and trade relations. Perez notes that efforts to increase domestic rice production were hindered by economic dependencies and political constraint, which has even continued after the revolution. So my inter... All of this... Let's just back up. All of this research starts from my interviewees. So... Now I will explain actually where this curiosity that I formed came from. My interviewees reveal a deep-seated connection between Cubans and rice, repeatedly drawing parallels between Cuban and Chinese rice consumption, emphasizing rice's centrality in daily life. One person even expressed 
um, that rice is essential as essential to Cubans as meat, which also is an interesting thing to say, considering that meat is also very important to them. Um, and I just want to add kind of an asterisk to this because during the conference, um, Parr pointed out um, it could be interesting to analyze different identities within Cuba. Um, and one identity that would be interesting is Chinese Cubans because, or Cuban, Chinese Cubans, Cuban Chinese, um, because there are many Chinese uh, Cubans who are of Chinese origin in Cuba today. Um, and so actually this connection that people were making between um, that Cubans eat more rice than Chinese, the intersection between Cuba and Chinese would be very interesting. Anyways, that's all I'll say on that. Lastly, when I was interviewing someone and trying to slightly hint at the question of replacing rice within the diet because of the vulnerabilities of importation, he paused and said, look, it's something we have in our DNA. Conversation ended there. So now let's talk about pork. The historical introduction of pigs to Cuba by Spanish settlers profoundly influenced cuisine. Gott highlights that pigs became a vital source of protein, not only for settlers, but also for pirates who appreciated dried pork. Garth, Dottie, Garth and Dottie elaborate on how Cuban cuisine evolved, but with, always with pork playing an essential role. During the years of the Cuban Revolution, pork production was prioritized to bolster domestic agriculture. The keynote, Reynaldo, writes about how a substantial increase in pork production following the importation of genetic material from Canada. Despite Initial challenges, significant progress was made, reflecting the importance of pork in national food strategy. The fluctuation in pork prices, as detailed by Benjamin, reflects the broader market conditions and government policies. Introduction of farmers markets in 1980 aimed to address food shortages, but also led to price disparities affecting pork availability. Um, it's also interesting to say that uh, in the conversation of pork also falls lard, of course, and that is a whole other category of food, kind of, um, and really allows you to get into um, libretta and rationing, which was, lard was one of the first things that was rationed in Cuba. So, oh, sorry, not done yet. Um, Munoz um, reflects on the gendered nature of food distribution in Cuban families with pork symbolizing masculinity and traditional male roles. The association of meat with fatherhood, as expressed in sayings like, El día de la carne es el día de los padres, underscores the cultural significance of pork. Additionally, during the special period, the symbolic value of pork was highlighted by urban pig raising, despite official prohibitions. Berti notes that Cubans went to great lengths to procure pork for traditional celebrations, illustrating the cultural and emotional significance attached to pork. That is all also related to La Caldosa, the um, um, New Year's and um, birthday celebrations and having to include a full pig on the spit and um, also connecting to the importance of celebration within um, crisis, which um, Hannah Garth has a very... Um, a very nice article about celebration. So now let's conclude. So food shortages in Cuba have been a significant factor altering traditional eating habits, economic restrictions due to the embargo or blockade and the fall of the Soviet Union contributed to these shortages. Um, many of my interviewees talked about the need of adaptation within these periods. Garth discusses Cuban efforts to promote healthier eating by reducing pork consumption and increasing vegetable intake, which reflects ongoing um, adjustments due to health concerns, but also the changing of food availability. 
So despite economic hardships and supply issues, pork remains central to Cuban culinary traditions. Interviewees emphasize its role in celebrations and family gatherings, reinforcing its symbolic value and cultural importance. One interviewee stated, Esa es la llave de la comida. Um, this is the key to Cuban food, he was saying. Carne de puerco asada, roasted pork. So the concept of cultural hunger emerges as a crucial factor in understanding the role of rice and pork in Cuba. This term reflects the deep-seated need to preserve cultural practices and culinary traditions despite material scarcity. The interviewees, pre the interviews presented in and historical context reveal how Cubans navigate food shortages while maintaining culinary heritage. So. I would just like to end um, by saying that my sources are lacking um, in um, the Spanish sources. So anyone watching this, if you um, if you have um, Spanish sources on this topic, I would love to hear them. Um, I think, yeah, here is my contact information. If anyone would like to discuss this further, I would be very interested. Reynaldo pointed out at the end of my um, presentation that, um, you know, there is a huge discrepancy between the need, this cultural need, and also the environmental need with importation and um, the environmental impact of pork production uh, and also rice production. So that is something that also needs to be further discussed. And thank you. I'm ending it here. Bye.